If your fear of abandonment is still there, believe it or not, the way the ego works is it'll bring everyone into your life. You're only attracted to people that would abandon you. But if you actually are healed of that, you go on a direct path and the type of people that abandon you wouldn't even come into your field. So there's major power in being present for the darkness that's here. There's a major fake light on the pedestal and there's a fake light on the pedestal that you might have for someone or someone has on you. Pedestals are unbelievable unbelievably dangerous and it puts us into this world that someone is higher or lower than me and at the, the end of the day it doesn't matter who the hell you are we're all on this planet to do the work to go inward to transcend things even your favorite speaker or author is going through a ton of dark shit also and transcending their childhood patterns so if you put yourself on a pedestal over someone else you're going to be knocked off off the pedestal if you put someone else on a pedestal over you you're going to both be knocked off and you'll be very very upset that they weren't the image that you put them on. Welcome to Growth Minds. Whether it's your first time here or you've been here before, I'm curious to know what it is that brought you here. And if you can, smash that like button below. It really helps spread our message to more people. All right, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the show, Kyle. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, brother. I'm honored to be with you. Yeah, I was. Uh, well, this is technically our second time recording this, but <laughs> I wanted to share that this is very rare to see someone that had this transition in their life in terms of, you know, in one of the book descriptions, it's that you describe yourself as if Eckhart Tolle and Jim Carrey merged, this is the, 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 the being that you are today. And I, I thought it was really fascinating where, you know, earlier in parts of your life, it was more of the gym where you wanted to be the top stand-up comedian or comedian and actor from the age of 12. And you really reach one of the pinnacles that you can in that industry to shift towards uh, the, the the career and, and the, the work that you're doing now, helping millions of people around the world. I would love to know what were kind of the initial dreams that you had at that age of 12? And how did you manage your expectations as you decided to make this massive transition in your career? You know, what's weird is I'm in another one right now and I'm starting to get very very just excited about the fact that first of all, all of us are able to transform, you know, like the, the thing that you're talking about is something that implies that you don't have to only be what at one point was your dream career. You don't have to be your story. You don't have to be this, the, the codependent person you are or the avoidant person you are that it's literally almost all, uh, changeable. And yeah, I was, uh, you know, I was a kid that became a stand-up comic and for, I guess it'd be about 25 years. Cause I, I mean, I re well, I guess it'd be about 20 years cause I stopped at 32, but I was at the height of my stand-up career and realized there was something bigger that was trying to show up. And at the height of my career, I left stand-up comedy and it was a weird thing because at one point stand-up comedy was the highest thing. And a lot of times we attribute something that at one point was our highest thing to it's always my highest thing. And, you know, a good example would be if you look at the world trying to ascend at one point, the Wright brothers were very cutting edge when we had no planes and they were inventing a plane in a time where flying would be almost impossible. And someone did that with a phone, someone did that with a light bulb, someone did that with a cell phone. But now if we tried to do that, like who cares? Like if someone was inventing the plane, it wouldn't matter. And humans are the same thing that they don't understand that something that was at one point your passion might no longer be. And a new passion is always trying to birth. Ironically for the last, um, I guess it was 13 years that I've been this transformational speaker that combined comedy and transformation that still exists, but a new element of me is birthing. And the new element that's really calling to me is me really learning what being a man on a level that I've never seen is being 
a powerful protector, all these other things. And the reason I say that is because when I was a kid, my mom, who was really my best friend and how I learned life, was always scared that I would get hurt. She was always mm. like, if you did football, you'll get paralyzed. If you ride a motorcycle, you'll, you know, you'll die. If you go to Hawaii, there'll be a tsunami. I mean, they, there was a sentence for everything. And I carried her fear in my cells and always worried that I would get hurt. And recently, within the last couple of years, I started to go to jujitsu and Ooh, nice. face all my, my fears of being hurt. And I can feel that the cells in my body really are my mom's fear, right? And if I keep going to jujitsu, they just start to lose their control and they leave. And I've noticed that I, I go and I feel a new power that I've never felt before. And, you know, for some people, they might have done martial arts their whole life and it might be to branch out and build a business or to take time and not date anyone if you've been in a relationship forever or whatever it is. But there's always a thing that's trying to birth through you. And we get so caught in this way is the answer, you know, and like my oh, it's not turns out I'm not a stand up comedian. I'm a transformational speaker. Well, even that's turning out to be not only the highest truth. It turns out I'm also a father and I'm working on that and I'm, you know, all these other things. So what I'm trying to say is that for everyone, especially for the people that go, I really want that, but that's not like me. Just mm. so you know, the fact that you want it means it's totally possible for you. And it's not like you means it's not like your conditioning, like your the, the fear-based cells in your body. And if you say yes to that thing, those fear-based cells will dissolve. So that so it's funny because as you're asking me about the story of when I trans you know, move from comedy to transformation, I'm like, God, even that's an old story now. Like it's like there's I'm like. Right now, I'm enjoying putting people into chokeholds. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. exciting because you're in this moment at this point where you're in this midst of the transition. A lot of the interviews that I've heard you talk about going from comedian at the, t at the peak of your career into a transformational speaker, that's already happened. You know, you were well into your transformation, into your speaking career, into your you know, writing books and helping people. And now it seems that you're you know, kind of in the present moment, you're, you're, you're going through chokeholds. You're, you're being, you know, I've done jujitsu as well. You're being choked out by like, you know, 16 year old kids. And it's, it really teaches you that humility that is, you know, well, it's very humility. It, it very, it's very um, humbling. Sorry. Humbling. Yeah. To go through that experience. You know, that's one of the things that I love about it so much. The fact that, you know, there's certain areas that I've, mastered and there's certain areas that everyone watching has mastered if you've been a parent for 20 years you're a black belt at parenting if you were if you were present and there and learned and grew if you've been in a marriage for 20 years you might be a black belt at, at being married or having a good long-term relationship if you've been single for 20 years you're a black belt at that i probably am a, a 10 degree black belt as a stand-up comedian and as a transformational speaker and mm. what I love about jujitsu is it's an area for me that I have to completely start over and completely like learn to walk again for the first time. And there can be something about having something mastered that's fulfilling. But then at one point it goes, yeah, that like I can feel that if I was to only keep doing transformational speaking without bringing this new element in, it would actually start to devolve. Like I've, you know, I'm able to help people release their feelings really, really well. And I'm, help, I'm able to see certain things. But there was an aspect of me as a man that I've never seen before. And mm. if I didn't bring that in, then the content would, everything would, you have to evolve as a human being. If you're not evolving as a human being, you're devolving. You know, even if you leave money in the bank and it's just sitting there, well, in a couple of years, that same thousand dollars you put in is actually worth less because of inflation and things just changing. So it's actually less money if it just stays stagnant. So we're either, you know, it's very basic Tony Robbins here, but you either grow or you die and you're either evolving into something. And really that to me is where I'm finding the most fulfillment and, um, you know, or you've, you're staying in the same situation and kind of devolving because your fear is not letting you move forward. And so yeah. I'm, I'm excited about what 
I know that it's the right thing when you go, I don't know what it would, what I will become, but I can feel the essence of it, but I can't see the specifics. You know what mm. I mean? Yeah. I think the difficult part for some people, I would, I would imagine a lot of people from being at that pinnacle or having achieved some sort of status or skill to break that down as you did to start from the beginning and to remove that ego of I'm at a certain type of power, but starting from new, you don't really have that basis, right? You don't have yes. the connections. You might not have the skills you might. And it's, again, it goes back to that humility aspect. You know, what, what are some of the things that allowed you to be starting over without that ego? Cause I think that's what really prevents a lot of people from reinventing themselves in many ways. The understanding that the journey is bigger than the destination. Cause when you're finally living at the destination, you lose your fulfillment, right? Mm -hmm. Like in other words, there needs to still be a climb there for me, there needs to be something new. Like, yes, the, the evolving out loud as it has been, has hit something that's great. It's very lucrative. We're very successful and I can get a lot of attention with it and a lot of love and a lot of scene. And that can start to become addictive, by the way. That can start to be like, you know, why bother growing? You, you have the money you need, that things are paid off, you, you know, and people like you, right? So you don't need to find any more of who you are. You don't need to look within. And I think this is why some very successful people get really depressed because they hit the top and realize it was about what you were becoming as a person, not just getting to the outcome. And for me, getting to the outcome at one point really um, hit its its peak. It was just like there, like I I'm able to do one on ones. We have the absolutely everything pass, which is amazing. And I've probably done I don't know a total of a thousand calls or a thousand hours of content on it. And I can do it in my sleep. I can literally go on and do a call. Uh, shift people, awaken people, whatever. And it's not, it's like, there's, n I don't know more about me though. And right. I can see that I can do that on the external, but we really need to find the depths of the most that we can without being hard on ourselves of what we are. And I noticed that the area of what I am as a man, the area of what I am as strong physical energy that can protect if someone were to break into a restaurant that I know I start to feel like it's always been a given to me that I would probably be able to talk him out of it emotionally, <laughs> you know, but I, I don't have a part of me. I, it's starting to build that felt like I could physically take them. Mm -hmm. And, um, that is bringing up the inside of me more, you know, it's, it's getting more and more inside for me, right? At first mm -hmm. it's stand up comic, you know, you achieve laughs, you, you have a good set, you all this stuff. Then the first fall apart happened where there's a deeper me that wants to know more about me than the, the comedy. And I realized, man, I learned how to be a comedian before I learned how to be a person. And so the second wave of me going, I understand feelings. I understand how to transcend stage fright. I understand how anxiety works and what it is. I understand how panic attacks work. I understand how many illusions we're under. You can, you can already see the lie of when something happens, I'll be happy that we all live in. And the shift in my life was from when something happens, I'll be happy to when I'm happy, things will happen. And I started learning how to really be okay with what is. Then I went through a phase of not just thinking of positive, but also becoming a space for the negative, realizing in the body there's shame. And if you just keep thinking of the positive all the time, you're kind of burying something that's still there mm. and that the lower needs to be seen, that the the part of you that feels guilt, shame, unloved, unseen needs to be just as amazing as success and achievement and mastery. That part of mastery includes a love for the, the, what you see as your darkness, but really what makes it darkness is you're not seeing it. So I've really been fascinated by that and going within and then learning how to cry out all of the patterns that really aren't you, that every limitation pattern in your body, 
every, yeah, that's not me. Every, I can't make money. Every, I'll never find a partner. Every, it's not that easy is a lie. It's a pattern and learning how to transcend patterns. And that's something I got really good at and going, okay, there's, there's more in here. And then going like to the coriest core of what you thought was you and going the whole essence of the truth that I thought was Kyle's actually still conditioning from my parents. And I want to see what actually I was supposed to be. If I transcended all of my parents' fears and all of the ways I could get hurt and all of the, you know, ways of that my dad lived or the ways that my mom taught me to be or whatever, and asking myself to start the practice of birthing an even deeper layer of who I am. Mm. And, um, I'm noticing all these side lessons show up in that. Um, it like reminds I, me of the Carl Jung, you know, doing the shadow work, you know, facing your shadows rather than running away from it, which is, yeah. you know, what, what a lot of us do because of the, you know, fear of being hurt or the fear of not, you know, wanting to see that part of ourselves because we live in this kind of shallow day-to-day -day distracted world where we don't think about that stuff. Most people, if you leave them in a room alone, they'll go crazy because they're, they haven't had to do the work of facing themselves. You know, what are some of the recommendations you would have for people to really go embrace the shadows within themselves so that they can really get to the core of what they're here to do? Well, one way that I did it, uh, was I went to a darkness retreat for 10 days. Oh, um, interesting. I, I spent 10 days with zero light, zero light in completely pitch black, no sound. It was a little place in the woods in Ashland, Oregon, completely black, right? And they had a double door, so they'd put food in and then it would be dark again and I'd open that door. And, you know, the first few days, the first five or six days, I really thought that that was going to be about an even higher me that was going to birth. And it just kept showing me, stop thinking of high as better than low. Like huh. it just, I would be like, it's so funny because before I went in there, there was a really healthy, organic, amazing restaurant that I was like, when I come out of here, I'm going straight to that restaurant. And then the bizarre thing was when I got out of there, I went to a McDonald's because it goes, I want you to stop shaming low energy. I want you to stop thinking of, you know, things that you perceive like other, when you go, oh, that person's low energy, that person's bad energy, whatever. Well, they're only triggering in you what you haven't seen, because when you're really on your path and you're finally OK with your shadows, other people that you think of as low energy don't trigger you. They're just doing mm. their thing. When you're triggered by someone, that's showing you shit that's in your body that you haven't seen. Mm. And it goes, I want it, like, it was like the darkness goes, I want you to see that all that is, is perfect and not just keep trying to go to the higher. And bizarrely that created space for all that is. And the, the, the here replaced the high instead of trying to get everything good, get here and notice mm. that the here holds space for the good and the bad. And that this, this is unconditional love. Don't hear that as passivity. People sometimes hear that and go, so you're saying a guy abusing me is okay to hang out with. No, leave things that don't align with you. But this is about the triggers in your body that are saying, I can't handle this type of person, you know, when you go to a spiritual retreat, you'll hear almost everybody think everyone else is dark <laughs> and, and that they're right. the light of the world, you know? Right. And I, and with, in regards to your question about shadow work, you know, you said people run from it. One thing to take in is no matter how many times you run from it, it's going to come up again and you can deal with it now and then have amazing, an amazing future or, you can continually run from it and it'll act out in ways in your life. You know, if you, if you don't, in other words, look at your, let's say deep rooted fear of abandonment and you don't transcend it, you will continually only date the type of people that would abandon you hmm. because the ego's way of dealing with this stuff 
is to find the exact circumstance on the external so it can fix it. But the soul's way is to go, yeah, w w that's just not in our field, right? So if, you're, if your fear of abandonment is still there, believe it or not, the way the ego works is it'll bring everyone into your life. You're only attracted to people that would abandon you so that you can fix your childhood with your dad or something like that. But if you actually are healed of that, you go on a direct path and the type of people that abandon you wouldn't even come into your field, right? So there's major power in being present for the darkness that's here. And, and one great way to do that is to say things like, in the, in the old self-help, we used to try to fix it. Like if you felt unworthy, your way of fixing it would be, I'm going to show the world I'm worthy and earn a bunch of money or whatever. But the new thing that I think is trying to happen is sentences like you saying to the pattern in your body, you're allowed to feel unworthy in my body. Like, I love you even if you're alone. I love you even mm. if you feel abused. I love you if you're broke, right? Like we in the self-help world taught ourselves only become rich, only become powerful, only whatever. And that's good. But can you be okay with broke too? Because I find the more you're okay with the negative, the more you're making room for the positive. Ah, oh, interesting. It's at the yin and the yang. Like a person that really needs to be in a relationship will probably less be less successful at maintaining one than a person mm. who's completely fine with being alone. Mm. Right? It, it, I don't know if this is completely relatable, but it reminds me of this quote. It's... The, the war it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war yes and it's that it doesn't necessarily mean physical but it's the mental aspect of just being completely fine as you are instead of being the gardener that's completely distracted or unsure of themselves and i i feel that way for me a lot of ways as well like when chasing success or, or success or money i think initially it was the getting the approval of the parents. I grew up in a very traditional Korean family where, you know, it's either doctor, lawyer, or, or failure, right? Right. And it shifted to having a chip on my shoulders because of being bullied and, you know, being overlooked. So there was a bit of that dark side. And I'm trying now to go into that shift of abundance, a lot of what you're talking about, of not doing it for other people, but doing it for myself, that inner work. And... Um, yeah, that really resonates with, with me in terms of how to shift that mindset of really achieving anything. Have you ever said to the pattern in your body, you're allowed to feel bullied in my body? No, I've never said that. No, it's, it's usually, I, why did you bully me? Or yeah. I'm trying to prove myself. So that's words. all resistance to that that happened. And the way we transform is through love, right? So the pattern, if it understands that like, like, so I'll have clients, they'll be like, I have to do this. And I'll say, what happens if you don't? And they'll be like, I'll be a failure. So I'll have them say, you're allowed to be a failure in my body. Right. And the pattern in the body for the first time realizes it's enough, even if it's failed or, or if it's a bully or if I'm sorry, if it's bullied, if it's unworthy, this is, and then it leaves, by the way, like the story mm. of being bullied will leave your body. See, I think that's the fear, right? You people don't think it's going to leave. People think that's going to be a part of them if they let it, if they don't fight it. Right. It's and that's the, it's backwards. The mm. way that it works is your resistance to it keeps it there because you're egoically saying what is shouldn't be. This pattern that happened to me should not have happened. But so I'm going to, so think about this. So I'm going to build a business off of being bullied, right? Now mm. it's your pain that just built that business, right? Versus if the, imagine if the bullied was fully accepted until it did go, and I promise it would go. And you cry out and actually bring love to the boy that was bullied. Then instead of it being, don't bully me is building the business, a higher version of you that couldn't get to you because it was all about your war with being bullied will build your business. And it'll be a million times more successful because it's a calling versus everyone don't touch me. D does I, that make sense? I, it does. And it's 
that's really the advantage that you have in today's world is authenticity and really being part of what you're building. Like you, it, it is somewhat part of your identity and that's really what differentiates you, whether you're in the media business or whether you're, you know, building a, an app or whatever it might be, it's, it's really part of that. So no, it does, it does resonate with that as well. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I can um, see it's hitting something. Yeah, it just you, when you particularly when you said around, you know, let the failure sit in to my body. You know, I think people have that fight or flight kind of response when something negative enters into them, particularly mm -hmm. things that triggered them in childhood that was maybe never really worked on, right? And they say that like if you stumble your toe, you're, you're, no matter what other pains that you've had before in that present moment, that's going to be a 10 out of 10 pain for you. Cause that's the only thing that you feel at this moment. So when you feel this negative part inside of you, you're like, Oh my God, this is like the, the hardest thing I've ever had to face. Not yeah. even thinking about the past things that you've overcome and, uh, to think ahead and to, to embrace that it might not sit in you for. I know for a year or for, for even a day longer, it is, um, yeah, it's interesting to hear. I mean, is that, is that what you've had to face as you made through these different transitions? What are some of the expectations that you've had to let go for yourself? Oh, well, honestly, you want to know the truth, almost all expectations, because to me, expectations are, a, I don't know if this will make sense as I just say it, but a linear timeline. And I don't believe we were designed to be a linear timeline. So let me make, let me give you an example. Pretend you work in the first floor of a building, but you don't get there's other floors. So you're just like, I want to get to that end of the building. That's the ultimate place. That's linear. But you also are an elevator. And the elevator goes, yeah, th like this floor and there's this floor and there's this floor. And these are these are higher things. Right. So the highest expectation you can see is usually just on the floor that you're on. Right. So when people create an expectation, it might be usually including the ego also, because the most I see is this. So my fix to this problem is this expectation or, okay, I make 90,000 a year. So my expectation is next year, I'll make a hundred or even 110,000. Yeah. But you're also God. You're also this infinite magical universal being that mm. can is exponential. And if you undo your attachment to the story of who you were, even with the solution to the story of who you were, you start to leave your world of your expectations. I believe there's three levels. There's the first level is the world, the life you don't want. A lot of people live the life they don't want. They're stuck working at a gas station when they wish they were a singer or whatever. Then there's life you do want. You go, I want to be whatever. I'm going to be successful, write my book, be famous, whatever it is. Then there's the life God wants for you. And it's beyond what your expectations are. In other words, a lot of times the world we build for the life we do want is very often a protection of trauma. Like people fantasize about a better world as a child. Like I don't want to be like my dad or I do want to be like my dad or whatever. And you're creating visions based on what you've seen as a child so far, but the sky's the limit as to what you can create, but you're coming up with the highest the ego sees. So a lot of times the life that you do want was your escape fantasy out of the childhood you were in or whatever else. And so the third one is the life God wants for you, which is where you start following kind of I don't know what this is feelings that are based on a feeling, but not necessarily based on any evidence. And you start to learn that there is higher for you and there is God's will for you. And there is a, a higher frequency that's better because I know that I got to live the lives that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And there is now higher that's birthing. I would, the life that I wanted 10 years ago wouldn't have included jujitsu. Right. So there, there is a higher life trying to birth. Your screen went off. I don't know if you're still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, cool. So there is a higher life you're trying to birth. And um, I find that following that now is, is the only way to fulfillment and, and mastery in an amazing life. Hmm. 
as an argument to play the devil's advocate sure. for people that have high standards and high quality, you know, requirements of what they're doing. Some would argue that having expectations and high expectations, whether it's someone else that have done it or whether it's their own expectations of what they think should be the quality bar delivers an end result that may have been a higher quality because they've pushed themselves into matching these expectations. They may not be as happy, but the ultimate goal they have, whether it's producing a stand-up comedy or whether it's building a business has resulted in, uh, you know, the, the success that, that they have. Yes. So I've got to hit a lot of expectations that I've had for myself. I've got to hit a lot of goals. And I think the many amazing things came from that. But one of the best things was the understanding that first of all, first of all, any expectation I created meant I could already see that outcome. So that means there's a lot of not growth happening because if you just picture you'll make a million dollars and then you make it, then you already could see from the beginning that you could do that. So you just made happen a thing you already knew you could do. So that's a level that's great. And if that calls to someone, maybe that's a next step for a lot of people to just write out what you want and then go for it. That's so fantastic. I think as we go up in consciousness, we start to realize the more I let go and don't know why I'm letting go, but feel the feeling that it's right to let go, the more it's not just my ego that's creating something, the more that kind of things get a little bit more miraculous mm -hmm. um, and you're, you're working with source on a much higher level. And a lot of times in my eyes, quite a bit of expectations, although they serve a purpose and I'm not saying nobody do it, still comes from a frequency of control, mm -hmm. right? So for instance, if you were bullied, right? I'm not saying you specifically, but if someone was bullied, because I did have a client once who tried to build businesses off of being bullied and he, you know, it's, it's a, it's a feeling of control. I have control over this. I, I can see that I can prove them wrong or whatever. They still are running you like getting them to see that you're something still was a goal or getting other people to not bully you still was a goal. That's awesome. There's just also a frequency where I've discovered that in the process of letting go of something without knowing why, the only reason you're stressed or sad is your ego can measure what you will lose, but it can't see what you'll gain. Mm. So you start moving based on feeling and faith without knowing specifics and you, you move vibrationally. When you let go of something that you were egoically holding on to, the part of you that held on to it also can die too. So the egoic construct that needed things to be a certain way, and then you let go of that dies. And it's almost like it's replaced by more God, more light, more magic, more higher level ideas, more million dollar ideas you couldn't see because you were more in the lower frequency of I got to do this thing. So I find there's also an exponential amount of surprise results that are beyond the highest expectations I could ever have. If I follow the frequency and the feeling and not quite need to know the specifics of what I'll get for it, then if I can see the entire plan. In fact, I think a lot of heartbreak and pain is due to expectations. Like when someone goes through a breakup, a sentence I've said before is you're not, they, they didn't, a lot of people think they broke your expect, they broke my heart. They say they broke my heart, but they didn't, they broke your expectations. And by breaking your expectations, they got you closer to your heart. Mm. So expectations cause things falling apart to be way worse because you didn't expect that or think that was supposed to happen. When you start to move with source, you just think of everything as, as you following a higher you and things that don't work is, is life making things break off of you that are not in your, it's not the same egoic story that you were supposed to have this. And this was the answer to your life. You just start to go up an elevator and floor three leaves because you're going to floor four. So things that fall off of you are supposed to, and you don't have that fight against what is, you know, and 
we get often very in love or create expectations based on a certain level we're at, but life might want to take us to a higher level. And so it's more learning surrender, but not passive surrender, still following what it wants you to do and going, man, do I have a world for you if you learn to follow me versus follow your solution to not being worthy or your solution to feeling alone. I mean, the amount of relationships that start because people don't want to feel alone is, is staggering. And those relationships all end because that wound is still there. And, and God's trying to get those wounds out of us now. Mm, yeah. And that initial core that made them start that relationship is also coming from that expectation, right? You know, we grew up watching Disney movies of, you know, the white, you know, the, 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 the white in the white horse and the night night and, you know, from carrying us from the castle yes. or the princess Yes, that is going to save the day and make everything better. And we enter these relationships and in some cases, where we put the other person on a pedestal that and, and build them up to the point where they can't even meet that expectation. Right. And it's what leads to the breakup, right? Because we think that there's the one and the next person is going to solve all of our problems. When, you know, for me, I've always believed that one plus one equals three in that each of us have to be happy and, and, and wholesome and fulfilled, not perfect, obviously, but enough where we're adding value to each other and we can create something together and grow together. And I think it's that other expectation that you mentioned where some people just can't meet the expectations that you have. And I think that's more than that more true than ever in, a, yes. in the world of dating today, especially Agreed. where there's so many options. Yeah. Well, that's so true. I mean, you also fall in love with your image of the person much more than the person. Right. Like if you've been doing your own inner work, you're suddenly putting on them that they will, too. And you see this potential about them and that they're this infinite, changeable being. And they, they they might be. But you're starting to create a vision of who they are and you don't know them. And you can go on yeah. a first or second date and really go, this one's the answer because and you do not know them. And you don't know how they see the world and you don't know and you start to create like your physical attraction to them and combine it with a story of who they are and you're not being with the moment you're not hearing now and you know do you even know if you'll evolve during it or maybe the evolution is that you're not is supposed to let go of them you know sometimes just i don't want to be alone creates these codependent things that if you're codependent, you'll only attract another person that's codependent. If you're a people pleaser, you'll only attract a taker or another people mm. pleaser. So nobody's happy. But if you're, if you're in alignment, you can see through the people pleasers of the world. And, you know, you'd only accept someone that can take you beyond what you can see about yourself and that you can do that for them. Cause there is a cap to what we can see in ourselves. Um, and then if someone outside can mirror a better you to that or hold a higher you to help you transcend your pain faster, that's a, that's a win. But if they're kind of just, you know, in their own stuff and you just need to tell the world that you have a, a, a person you're dating or feel like you're not alone, that will eventually just be an addiction that stops you from your, your soul. So you'll let go of it. Yeah. Especially if you have these high expectations, as soon as you see a fault in that person, yeah. Then in your mind, you go, oh, well, maybe this person is not the one. My, the one that I had in my expectations is a perfect human being that checks all of these boxes. And yes. as soon as you realize they, this person is a human, they have faults, they have weaknesses, then you start to have these, you know, happiness equals what? Reality minus, minus expectations. And you have all of these or expectations minus reality. And when reality hits, the expectations was built so high that, you know, this is kind of the modern dating that we have today. We have options and you have high expectations and uh, there's no reason why so many people are single today, right? We, we need to switch to acceptations versus expectations. Like I'm going to mm. accept this about this person or I'm going to accept this about myself. Really learning how to see and accept is going to be massively more powerful and I believe more lucrative and more fulfilling and more better relationships 
not accept like passive, you got to hear that the right way, but learning to find love for things so that you can transcend your patterns that judge those things. Mm. But also you're talking about pedestals. I'll tell you as a speaker, there's nothing worse than pedestals because people put expectations on me or for you or for other speakers, right? That anyone that they don't, they aren't a person you know, and that they, they don't, it's like, we're here because we fall apart and make mistakes and suck a lot sure. of times and grow. And one thing I noticed in the self-help world is working with a lot of different people that I could see, and this is their journey. So it's not that I'm judging it, but I just am bringing it to light where there's a presentation of perfection and, and a creation of you all put me on a pedestal because I'm the answer to things. And those people I know behind the scenes and they're completely different. And the more that their image is getting rocked, the more that insanity and anger and control freak shows up. So there's a major fake light on the pedestal and there's a fake light on the pedestal that you might have for someone or someone has on you. Pedestals are unbelievably dangerous and it puts us into this world that someone is higher or lower than me. And at the, the end of the day, it doesn't matter who the hell you are. We're all on this planet to do the work, to go inward, to transcend things. And every person you can think of is on this planet because it's a school for our ascension. And mm. so even your favorite speaker or author is going through a ton of dark shit also and transcending their childhood patterns and making mistakes or whatever, not who you think they are. And, and the more we can get to a place where we go, the person I put on a pedestal is not where I think they are. And I on not on the pedestal am not where I think I am. In other words, I'm not right. off the pedestal either or less than too. It's just like I am now, and there's patterns that are coming through that I'm seeing and transcending. But yes, if you put yourself on a pedestal over someone else, you're going to be knocked on th off the pedestal. If you put someone else on a pedestal over you, you're going to both be knocked off and you'll be very upset that they weren't the image that you put them on. But I think there's nothing grosser in our world than pedestals because it's just like, I know that everyone has darkness and, and shit. And um, I've been backstage with many of the people that are on enormous pedestals. And I know the real energy in that. And there's no judgment for it. I, I, in fact, I love their inner children. They're blocking it because they're on their own pedestals and don't want to look at the real shit that's there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I learned, I learned life on the pedestal, right? I was on stage as a comic forever in Comedy Central and all the shit and wanted to be seen for a long time as the pedestal guy. And that's gross. <laughs> like, you know, like, let's all go to dinner and talk about me. I need the stage. And I'm embarrassed by that guy. You know, mm -hmm. he's great. And I still love him and transcended him. But I don't want to be that. I, I want to be a person who makes mistakes and learns from them and grows. And I want that for everyone that thinks that they're they're less than to know that we're all in this. Every one of us is in this. And even your favorite speaker or someone you look up to, I don't care if it's Mother Teresa, there's days where she's behind the scene going, shit, God damn it. And you don't know, <laughs> you know, like, I hope I can. Speak. Yeah. No, of course can you I can. Can I say Mother Teresa? <laughs> of course. Uh, when you look back at that person that was putting yourself on a pedestal as a stand-up comedian, actor, and you look at yourself now backstage speaking to you know your, your your fans your audience other people around what are the key differences you think in terms of the inner voice that's in your head as you're interacting with these people mm, that's interesting well ironically one of the things i'm getting better at is having i don't mean this in a weird way but but creating a boundary in space a little bit in other words when people were putting me on a pedestal and were fans I would sit there and hear them because like and for a long time, meaning, you know, and people around me that were hanging with me are, are dropped while I'm listening to how great I am and taking mm. all the attention and, you know, and not there with people that I was hanging with or a partner with or whatever. And we're going to talk about what you changed because of me. Well, okay, then. And I think now, you know, I have a five-year-old daughter and I still hear people and I appreciate it, but I also, one, reflect to them, they did the work. I'm just offering tools, two, that I'm a person and have a lot of flaws. Three, 
I hear them to a point, but then also go, I need to take a break or I need to go because I don't want my daughter to start getting anxiety every time a fan shows up. <laughs> and, mm. and just, I think that a lot of people don't see their magic and then do see the other. And there was a great quote I heard one time. One of the reason you're really upset is you're comparing your behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel. And right. Instagram is full of highlight reels. You know what I mean? It's just like, here's like my black and white photos of my marriage with my spouse. And then if you're there with them for a week, you find out they're fighting every day or there's cheating or <laughs> like, it's just like, yeah, it's not what you thought, you know, right, but right. you just see the Instagram images. You're like, why don't I have that relationship? I want theirs. You know, you're mm. wrong. You it's know? ironic because oftentimes when you share these faults and these human like features that you have, which are, you know, it can be self-consciousness. It can be doubts that you have. People often relate more to you, right? People can, yes. can actually see that journey of you going through it as you are now. I mean, you talking about the difficulties of jujitsu and the work that you're doing in yourself to build this neck, you know, the masculine frame. It's, it's you know, obviously a very transparent way to go through that journey and bring the audience with you as they're as you're as you're leveling up and as you're as you're going back down as you're going back up and you you end up losing some people that had you on a pedestal and that's mm. fine in other words if they want to see you as perfect and they need an answer of authority outside of themselves you might lose them but that's good because because you need the match to what you are not people that keep you on the pedestal, you know, it's really sure. interesting because let's say you're a guy that wants to date and there's, there's videos of this stuff. If you go out in a Lamborghini, there's going to be a ton of certain women that you will attract, but you're attracting the people that like that you have the Lamborghini, right? And if you're, if you're all made up and decked out and you're like, I'm going to look the best at the thing, you might attract a bunch of guys, you know, or whatever, man or woman, whatever. And then now they like you just for the physical. You're set up because for a problem, which is fine. The problem is fine. But you're, you're being loved for an image, not for your soul. And when you present the image, you're going to find fans of the image. And I'm really in the business of finding the deepest authenticity and losing the fans of an image. And, and then really finding an audience who also see they're not an image and stop shaming themselves from the image or whatever and go, we're in this together because I don't want followers. I want co-leaders, people who are leading themselves. I do not want just followers. I don't want to be a cult. I don't want to be a, you know, like do it my way. Like, it's just like, I'm unfolding. I have a ton of things I'm working through and you know, being able by the way to work through them publicly makes it way easier too. You know, if I'm like, I'm this way, perfect, aren't I perfect? And then underground, I'm like dealing with all these issues, but don't want anyone to ever know about it. It's way harder to do. But if I'm just like bringing to light, there's this issue, there's this issue, you know, whatever, then you do create a world where other people that have that issues go, thank God, it's just not, it's not just me. Other people that are, you know, whatever. And man, you, you grow a ton and know that the that the person you want to date you might have them on a pedestal you're setting yourself up for disappointment but if you go if you go man this person feels good and i understand they will have a ton of problems and not align with me in a lot of ways right that just undoes expectations right there but it it moves you from expectations to just listening listening who they are not deciding who they are not turning them into who you wanted not like just really like opening to that's where they are, you know? Yeah. 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 There, there's obviously the popular saying that never meet your heroes because they're oftentimes going to be disappointed. And it seems like you're trying to do the opposite, which is just share who you are and the people yes. that, you know, can resonate with your work are going to meet you in person are going to see the real you and not be surprised by it. They're going to see the real you, whether it's on camera or off camera, obviously we have some different falters, but, yeah, it's it's uh it's really relatable in terms of that authenticity. Um, I want to shift to money a little bit here, Kyle, because you sure. have your book, The Illusion of Money. Yeah, and I think when it comes to money, 
that relationship that we have comes from a lot of the expectations that we talked about, a lot of the ego, a lot of not facing the dark shadows that we had from childhood and chasing something perhaps that isn't going to either fulfill us or is actually going to repel us from having it because we get into industries that are not something that we're passionate about, uh, a work that just isn't going to make us last in the need, in the work that you need to do in order to make the, um, the, the wealth that you want. So talk to me a little bit about our, you know, people's relationships with money and, and how that, you know, has evolved for you. Well, thank you for asking. One of the things and the book, so I wrote a book called the illusion of money to answer for people that you said my book, it's called The Illusion of Money. And it could also be the illusion of so many things, the illusion of relationships, the illusion of my body, the illusion of all these things, right? Because there's two areas where there's money. There's money outside of you, and then your perception of money inside of you, right? And for some people, money equals I am free, right? Money equals freedom. And right there, you're already saying I'm not free, right? Mm. Money equals freedom, not I am freedom, right? Money equals security. So I'm not right. Money equals all these different things. And you could say that with a relationship, a relationship would be when I'm finally fulfilled. So me alone isn't right. And so we we've created this lie that money equals these things and immediately decided that we don't. And what's so funny about how money works is we forget that we are the source of every dollar that we made. Like we make money our God, but every dollar you've ever made came from you. Right? So think about that for a second. You are the source of your money. So imagine if you and I went for a walk and imagine that you and I went for a walk and I found a waterfall around a corner that you can't see. And I find a whole waterfall. Wouldn't it be weird if I took a cup, poured the waterfall into the cup, came back with a cup of water and said, dude, look, a cup of water, but I don't mention the source of it. Mm. You would you would look at the cup of water and you would think limited thoughts because you'd see a limited amount the way we see money. And you would go, how do we, okay, how do we ration this out for the month? Like, do we drink a little now? How do we pay our water rent? How do we, do we donate? We can't donate any, whatever, right? But if I show you the waterfall, you have an infinite supply and you'll be like, I can donate some, I can put some away, I can do whatever because I'm the source of it. And so we don't ever look at the source. We look at a limited supply of it and then go, this is me. This, mm. this is the answer to my life. And so you got to stop seeing money as bigger than you. Like every creative idea came from you. In fact, you could even more connect to the source that it came from, which is beyond the story of Kyle, but the space that created Kyle, right? There's this space here that it's full of ideas and possibilities and next steps and all kinds of things. Yeah. Saying yes to stepping into that, that's, that's the source of everything. So your job is to connect to that. Powerful, powerful. And why do you think we have this glass ceiling that we've put on ourselves? Do you think it's the relationship that we had with our parents and how our parents have treated money? Like, where does yeah. that all come from? Like how we I, perceive money in general? I think that, I think that we started out at a lower level of consciousness, which was more about survival. And even though there's a lot of survival aspects to life right now, it's more at thrival as a possibility, right? you thriving is now more the consciousness than survival. In the 20s and the 30s, people weren't looking at their emotions nearly as much as they are now. They weren't doing the same spiritual work. The highest we knew was whatever. Some people went to war and just tried to stay alive. There was a Great Depression. There were different things that were happening. And then these, these people just went and went through dark shit and created this specific leave it to beaver image of themselves as like, 
perfect on the outside while undoing themselves from all of their emotions. And that's why people in the past were able to stay in relationships for like 60 years, because you don't know anything about what's inside. You ask mm. your grandpa what they feel. They might have been in a relationship forever, but they sacrificed themselves to stay in that relationship. Right. Yeah. So at that same way, the highest anyone really knew was just get a bunch of money and get a, any job because money's your God, not God, get any job, get money and get kids and then retire. That's it. That's the highest we know. And now there's a consciousness that's birthing that says, Hey, just so you know, you're also an artist and a creative magical being, and you have infinite ideas in the same space that made some of our biggest heroes, whatever Michael Jackson, or, you know, Maya Angelou or whatever else, that space that made them where they got their ideas and their songs and their creativity is the same space that creates you. So connect to that and stop connecting to the old pattern of the conditioning of the old world, because that's not you now. Right. Mm. And do you feel in the new times, like what, what are your thoughts around this idea of following your passion when it comes to your career? Do you believe people should follow the, the passions and, and, and make that the career that they have built? Yes, but I do very much. But I think that people, so I want to just bring up the shadow to that is there's this yeah. bizarre pressure that's come from self-help where I get a lot of clients now who feel like I didn't put my book out or I didn't get my voice out or I didn't get this thing. I feel like I've wasted my life. Mm. And so it's not a calling now. It's like a warden that has pressure. It's like, you better write your book, right? Sure. And so you, you don't realize that's not your passion. That's your, you should, that's your, mm. you better. That's societal and childhood conditioning following it's don't hurt me. And we're calling it passion. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I've heard a, a different perspective, which I thought it was also interesting, which is similar to what you mentioned is when we follow the passions and what was once, let's say, an art for us, when we start to combine that with monetization and earning money in order to meet the basic needs that we have, when you look at, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, we have kind of the basic needs in the bottom and then self-actualization on the top. And some people argue that you should focus on meeting those basic needs that you have from food to putting a roof over your head to taking care of your family with what society rewards you from the currency that we use, which is money, so that you can free yourself to focus on the passions where that passion isn't commingled with needing to meet those Ma Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, 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 and I found that to be like an interesting argument. I'm curious like what your what your thoughts are there where people can distinguish those two things? Well, at one point I do realize that as you follow what the now is saying, what your heart is saying, it will take care of finances. But I understand if people are in horrible, you know, money situations that just following some passion that might take time to make money sounds ridiculous, but you might not realize that if you follow God's passion for you, it might be like, just get a day job first. Like, like, like learning the gray area is a passion at one point. You start to understand mm. that, in other words, like we can be all or nothing thanks to old self-help, right? Where we're just like, I'm going to become right. the richest in the world. And what if God's going, I'd like you to just learn you're enough, even if you work at Foot Locker. You know, like, I want you to learn that, that, that it's also about what the passion is that I find the universe has for me. Because sure. sometimes it might be like, could you just like sometimes it goes could you just learn how to clean like clean your house and like that doesn't sound like as big as filling a giant theater and you know making millions of dollars but it's going that's actually a higher for you a mm -hmm. higher passion for you would be like learning presence and learning to take time like that you're in service and in the now even just washing a dish than you know getting somewhere you know mm. And yeah. sometimes our ego's passion is in the way of what God's trying to get us to learn on the way. You yeah, know? that gray area that you mentioned is interesting. And it goes into what you talk about, which is like you want people that are going to co-lead, right? You're not going to just take people that 
take everything you say as gospel. People oh, wait, have to figure out what is going to be, you know, it'll relatable never, for what. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just got so passionate about that. No, no, please. It'll never work if you're doing what someone else said to do. Mm. Yeah, like everything I say, I try so hard to say all the time, only take what aligns, make sure it aligns with you. Even if I'm working with someone in a private, like one-on-one, -on -one, I'll say, maybe this is what you want, but they, it'll never work if you're doing it because something said to do it. It has to meet a calling in you too. Mm. Does that make yeah. sense? If it, it does, doesn't, yeah. you're screwed mm. because, because you're just doing what someone else said. So it's not your passion. Right. So, so I know people that'll just bring like, this book says do this, but this book that says do this and they're different. And I said, you'll never succeed at something that is just which way do I go? Because it's trying yeah. to get you to birth what your way is. Right. And so no direction is the answer. Hmm. Does yeah, that it does. Yeah. It, it reminds me of that philosophy. Tim Ferriss once put out a blog post sharing his entire blueprint to creating a successful podcast. And one of the reasons, you know, one of the comments that someone gave him was like, why are you revealing all of your secrets? And he had an interesting response, which was, you're never going to play my game better than me. Right. And that this is a strategy that works specifically for me. And you can't play someone else's game and expect them to beat them. You have to have your own path that you have to create. Um, so it, it does remind me of that. Um, you know, you want to go farther with that. I'll take that even more because what he said is great. And that's true. Like, that's a good thing to hear. Like you have your own unique way. And even if someone else tries to do it second, it's not going to touch it. But even past that, there's no me. Like, in other words, mm. the story of me, like, in other words, I really love one day I saw Michael Beckwith talking and he said, you know, if you take an orange off a tree, the orange doesn't, the tree doesn't go, that's mine. It goes, go ahead and take that. I got the original. I can print these all day. And so the source of what Tim Ferriss is that created that he's connected to, so he can create all kinds of new ways or whatever. And anyone just doing what he said uh, might gain a lot of their own unique way from that as a start or whatever. Like, but also, it's weird to be like, this is mine and not yours. And I sure don't mean it in terms of permission to steal. I mean it in terms of freeing yourself if you feel someone stealing from you. Mm. You know, like, like I have that happen all the time. We find someone who's putting out a bunch of videos that's verbatim my content or whatever else. And, you know, I used to feel territorial, especially as being a stand-up comic where we were very mm. like, that's my joke, not yours. And then, and then in this field, it's like, I'm like, wow, my content's going out to a whole other group of people. Think, you know, what God wanted said is now coming out from this dude that stole it. <laughs> it's like, mm. take it. You're not going to, you're not going to lower my work. And if you do, then that's calling me to a greater version, mm. right? Like if you just start taking it and you're doing better with that, that I, there's a deeper me that needs to form. I need to make more masterpieces and major power stuff, you know, like there's Powerful. a everything's trying to take you to a higher level. Yeah. You're creating a win-win situation where most people would have called it a lose-lose situation. Uh, I, I, I hate going backwards and being like debating on that. It's not even mine. It's God's, mm. you know, like why am I territorial about this thing that came through, mm. you know? Powerful. And, I think that's a great way. Yeah, go ahead. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's great to steal or something. In fact, it's, it's terrible, but for me, my freedom is not being looking backwards at people that took that or whatever, and just getting that, man, you can make even better. And it's calling you to a place of your real uniqueness. And sometimes I can get, I can get so complacent just taking a moment from my membership site and then making a YouTube video out of it and going, okay, mm. there's this thing. And there's a calling in me to go, what is my masterpiece? You know, I love the band, the beach boys, but I love them because at one level they were really big for their surfing hits. Like, you know, they're really famous for that. And Brian Wilson quit when they were touring and was like, I want to make, 
the greatest songs ever written and like stayed home when they were very successful and said, I'm going to make my masterpiece and made good vibrations and God only knows and wouldn't it be nice. And these kind of orchestral pieces that people go, that's like the greatest song ever written. Hmm. You know, if he was just able to, no one can steal good vibrations from him, but a lot of surfing ripoffs showed up. Do you get what I'm saying? Like at one point you're not even able to be stolen from if you tap into your real greatness. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're controlling what you can't control. You can't really control people from mimicking your work, especially in the day of AI content and right. what is real content, deep fake. I mean, it's, it's a crazy world out there. And it, it seems like you're embracing this idea of focus on what's under your control, very stoic way to think about um, what other people might, might do or not do. And I would say, don't get caught on the only way to see if you're successful is how many numbers you get. And the reason I say that is because we live in a world now that is so run by AI and mediocrity that like, you know, a band, a boy band that sucks could get more views than Miles Davis. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, like true art doesn't always have a huge following, but I'm here to find out what I am, not just cater to the masses, you know? And like, I noticed that what goes viral now is just fail videos falling down and then a cut to a guy (laughs) looking in the camera, kind of reacting. Like you'll see like a video and then a guy going, and then another video of something and a guy going, and I'm like, that guy's got 40 million views on that. And meanwhile, I'll put out something from my heart and get like 30,000. And I'm just like, all right, society's not necessarily where my highest is. And that's fine. No, no. Yeah. It's, I mean, you're, you're, you're embracing the, the change as well, which is great. Uh, you know, as a last question for you, Carl, you know, you've got a daughter and with AI and the change of society and how we work, all of these things is going to look very different, you know, 20, 30 years from now. How do you think this next generation or your daughter will perceive money when they're 25, 30, where maybe AI replaces a lot of the work that we do? Maybe, you know, we live in a world of digital coins and crypto and yeah. it's going to really be a, a different world in, in the next 20, 30 years. Well, one thing for the AI plan to continue and be dominant is for us to not evolve. And that's not happening. In other words, it was created in certain ways, like anything that was created out of control is on a linear timeline, right? Because it needs strategy. It needs people involved to know what we're doing. Anyone that's doing things based on controlling the world is going to lose their grip because are the only thing they need the, what they have to have to do what they do is secrecy and all of their stuff is coming to light. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I see is that we are evolving as a species. Now there are some people devolving, but some of them are going to either have to shift or addictive themselves into the ground, right? Like, and then, but, but we're, if you're looking at the future as what we can see from now, it's total bullshit. It's not, it's not, there's a lot of growth that's happening in human beings and our darkness is getting purged out of us and love moves instantly. Love can get a video to go viral instantly and, Mm. and strategy and all these different things has to keep everything contained and stay with a plan in a time where everything's evolving. So the strategies of the world, like if someone's got a dark plan for a year from now, right? We're, and we all awaken to it within the year, like they can't do it. <laughs> right. So when you said kids or your daughter, I would say, first of all, there, there might be a different perspective on how my daughter sees money from most, sure. most kids. But I do think the idea of us thinking of money as our God leaving would be fantastic. In other words, that there's a higher thing, my creativity, my flow, source, the highest callings in my heart are worth more than money. Then we'll stop settling for mediocrity and crap jobs that we don't like and become our brilliance and money will chase us. Um, But I think no matter what, our upset, like money's been so printed in the last three years and overinflated that money's just worth less and less. 
believe it or not, things are getting worth more. Like car parts are worth more than money now. You know what I mean? And and that that you start to realize our money's the only answer is silly. And what are we we're losing anything outside of us that's our authority. The government just is dark and weird and not necessarily our God. People don't look up to celebrities the same way anymore. People don't look up to the media the same way as in, anymore. So if we're all losing our grip on authority outside of us, what do you think we're going to grab onto? Ourselves. It's not, oh, that person wasn't who I thought they were. Okay, what am I? Mm-hmm. Right? And so if we start to, I think that there's going to be the fastest ascension in consciousness and we're going to, we're in the middle of moving from a third to fourth density consciousness and we're losing our doers and moving into our beers that are enough as is. And we're going to stop having crap relationships eventually and, you know, eating GMO food and anyone that had a negative agenda will be either freed, you know, from their, their own crap removed, you know, or, yeah, or whatever else. Cause the light's too bright for that darkness now. Yeah. I mean, as AI robots take over jobs humans are doing, humans can only adapt by becoming what humans have designed to do and differentiate ourselves or else we'll just be replaced. Right. Yeah. I I really believe that. And if I'm wrong, then we all get killed by a bunch of robots and (laughs) and this planet is in another life or going to another planet and it's better. Well, that's a very thought provoking way to close off this conversation, Kyle. I really appreciate your time and all of the insights that uh, that you've provided for us. Where can people find you? Where where should we take people that are listening and watching? Yeah. To, so obviously, the, you have the book, The Illusion of Money. Yeah. The Illusion of Money. I mean, I have a big YouTube channel, Kyle Cease, but then also my membership site, which we're now five years in, is enormous. It's got thousands of people on it. And it's, I put out a ton of content on there. There's over a thousand hours of backlog footage and I do three talks a week while there's two other teammates that do other talks on there. Um, It's called the Absolutely Everything Pass. And um, people say that it saves them so much money to have it because they're moving to higher level frequencies. I do hot seats, I shift people, and usually it's seven ninety five for a year. And right now they can get it for two ninety nine. dollars And um, I bring people on, I shift them in front of everybody. We answer questions like you'll be working with me eventually if you hop on and you can see hot seats. You can see me, you know, there's guided meditations and different exercises we do. It's awesome. And uh, interviews and all that other stuff too. But it's it's huge and very successful. And if you want to hear more of this content and be with my cutting edge, join me on the Absolutely Everything Pass. There you go. There you go. We'll have all those linked down below. Kyle, thanks so much for coming on the show. And hopefully we can get you back soon. I'm honored to be with you, brother. Great interview too. Great questions. It was fun to work with you. Appreciate it. 